Welcome to Everybody's Got a Story. Tonight, we are very lucky to have with us Dr. Jaime Tannenbaum and Dr. Donald Shepard, who are two uh, very involved people in the COVID virus. Um, our next event is going to be with Albert Levy, and the topic for that is never give up on your dreams. Following him is Rabbi Michael Whitman, our very own rabbi. Welcome to this evening, which is going to be filled with facts and information on the COVID virus, where we've been, where we are now, and where we are going. The format for the evening will be introduction of Dr. Tannenbaum. He will be speaking on the COVID virus in terms of what's been done in research in Canada. And then he will be introducing his son-in-law, Dr. Donald Shepard. And following that, there will be questions and answers. Questions and answers you can put on the chat and we will get to them in order. And depending if it's for Dr. Tannenbaum or Dr. Shepard, they'll be answering the questions. Rabbi uh, Michael Whitman will be thanking the speakers. So first, it is my honor to introduce to you uh, Dr. Jaime Tannenbaum. Dr. Tannenbaum is a, um, he's a real student of the Torah and he loves to chant uh, from the Parsha every week. And he does that at the Adath Israel, Monday morning and Thursday morning. So I think that I was gonna ask him for tonight just to do a half hour rendition of tomorrow's Parsha, but, um, I, I'm going to I'm going to allow you all to miss it, but if you join us tomorrow morning at 8:15, I have to put in the plug 8:15 tomorrow morning at the Adath. You can get the links on our website, and we'd love to have you there. Dr. Tannenbaum was born in Montreal. He went to Barham Bing High School. Surprisingly, he got into medical school at McGill and graduated from McGill Medicine. Following that, he got an internal medicine degree at the Albert Einstein College in New York. And this is the one that really threw me. He got his postgraduate fellowship in rheumatology from Harvard Medical School. So he has quite a fantastic CV. He's very active, was very active in the Beth Tikva Synagogue and also was the president of the House of Israel in St. Agath, which is probably where I met him, and we both were honored to have that position. His interest now is focused on reviewing some of the leading publications relating to the COVID pandemic, such as the Pfizer, the Moderna uh, vaccine, the Sputnik from Russia, uh, Regeneron, and the Lilly antibody treatments of COVID. To be honest and for full disclosure, Dr. Tannenbaum is not an expert on COVID. He does not treat COVID patients, although his daughter, Dr. Kara Tannenbaum, and his son-in-law, Dr. Donald Shepard, have that distinction. Tonight, we will share his knowledge about COVID. He will share his knowledge and how antibodies treat COVID, how antibody treatment of COVID, which was developed in Canada. Without further ado, Dr. Tannenbaum. Peter, thank you for that uh, warm introduction. Everything you said is probably true, except I beat you in golf, I mentioned that. Um, welcome to all of our Zoom participants tonight. I think we have about 200 people that registered. And like Peter said, I'm not an expert in COVID. My son-in-law, Don Shepard, is. He talks about it. I learn. I learn from medical journals, and we have regular meetings with doctors in my department. And I've been reviewing COVID literature for the last three or four uh, months or longer than that. And uh, I'd like to share with you what I've learned. And in particular, I kind of honed in on what, are, what is Canada doing? What are our Canadian researchers doing? And Rabbi, can we just share the screen here? Let's see if I can get it to go. Let's try that. 
Okay, hold and shift to select multiple windows. Okay, so good, it works. So what I wanna talk about, uh, let me just let's see if I can, Can't get out of this. Okay. What I want to talk about is some of our Canadian contributions to coronavirus research and treatment. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about research that was done at McGill, done at Laval University, done at University of British Columbia, and just highlight three areas that we're involved in. And then we'll stop. Uh, we won't stop, but we'll go into the question period. And I, not an expert, like I said, so I invited my son-in-law, Don Shepard, to come along. And many of you have heard of Don Shepard. He's in the news. He's on Mitzi Tumit's show. He's on Joe Schwartz's show. And he knows a lot about it. So let's get going. Don is a medical visionary. He looks beyond what you see in front of you. And he once told me about three years ago, you know, microbes, they're gonna rule the world. Our antibiotics in 25 years are not gonna work. There's all kinds of mutations. And we gotta be proactive. We gotta do something to get ahead of it. And so he decided that he would gather all the researchers at McGill, Lady Davis Institute, McDonald campus, anybody who had an interest in infection and immunity, and he gathered them together under one umbrella and he coined the terminology MI4, M for McGill, I4 for an interdisciplinary initiative in infection and immunity. And then he presented this idea to, to the dean. The dean loved it. We got a great idea, something new at McGill. Well, you need funding for this. Don went out, gave a pres presentation to the uh, Don Gong Foundation, and he raised $15 million as a gift to McGill to fund the MI4 unit. In the last three years, since its inception, the MI4 unit has funded 162 researchers and funds 96 projects. Comes COVID, what's MI4 do? Steps up to the plate. World Health Organization declares a pandemic on March 11th. The month of March, MI4 sends out an email, 250 investigators. What do you want to do to combat, combat COVID? It's going to take money to do that. MI4 raises three and a half million dollars. Within two to three weeks, before the end of March, they award 16 grants to the Gill investigators. In May, they raise another three and a three point one million dollars, award 20 grants. At McGill now, there's over six and a half million dollars in emergency fund that was raised just for COVID research. And there's at least 36 projects ongoing. And probably there will be more. What I'd like to do is just focus on one project. They're all good, but I've selected one. Made in Canada COVID PCR test developed at McGill. Sounds simple. Let's go back to March. Let's go back to the pandemic. Where was the PCR test coming from? From China. China supplied the world with PCR tests. They had the reagents. We were getting no flights from China. Our airports were closed. Everybody wanted a PCR test. Couldn't get it. Didn't have the reagents. Dr. Martin Schmeg works in structural biology. Dr. Dan Van Mayel works in neurosciences. They were all the hockey buddies. He said, hey, we got to make Canada independent. You got how we're going to go ahead and do a PCR test. And part of this test is you have to, there's about 20 reagents that go into it. Four of them are very complicated enzymes that have to be made from scratch. They got, they got to work. They got their colleagues in the biochemistry department, cell biology department, pharmacology. And they set about working, and within two months, they created a PCR test made at McGill. It was more sensitive than the commercial available PCR test at the time. They supplied 15,000 units to the, to the hospitals, and they figured the hospitals would need 15,000 units a week. It worked, and their labs are capable of making enough enzymes and reagents to generate 1 million PCR tests per week. Nice success story at McGill. 
Let me go now to the University of Laval. 1999, there were two students, agricultural students. Uh, they were working with plants and they were working with the alfalfa plant. And we know plants can make medicines, they can make proteins, they can make all kinds of things. So these two students working with the alfalfa plant and the alfalfa plant <laughs> belongs to a group of plants called Medicago. Uh, they decided that they would go ahead and make, form a company. They called a company called Medicago. About four years after they started their projects, Medicago was taken over, we'll say by a businessman, it changed its direction, it became a biopharmaceutical company with an interest in developing <coughs> vaccines and developing antibodies. It produced a successful flu vaccine in the United States about, uh, about five years ago. COVID came. They decided, okay, time to make a COVID vaccine. And they successfully made a COVID vaccine which is produced in a tobacco plant. They tested their vaccine already, about 184 patients in the phase one trial. The vaccine is safe, it's effective, it can generate humoral and cellular immunity. They've just gone into a phase three trial where they're studying their vaccine in 30,000 patients in 11 countries their results should be available in April, 2021. And if successful, Canada will have produced its own vaccine. As you know, there's a shortage around the world and we have the capability of doing it. And this company has produced vaccines before. Problem is they're not geared to produce vaccines for a pandemic. <clears throat> the government, in October, gave them $173 million to build a manufacturing plant. The manufacturing plant will be, the, will be a greenhouse the size of 10 football fields and be able to generate 2 billion doses of vaccine per year. Part of that $428 million was for them to, to, uh, cons to do their clinical trials on 30,000 patients. And also, the Canadian government is already pre-purchased 76 million doses of that of their vaccine even before the phase three trials are completed. Got to jump to another group of researchers, <coughs> excuse me, Canadian researchers at the University of British Columbia. At the University of British Columbia, there was Dr. Carl Hansen, Dr. Veronique Lecot, they develop certain kinds of techniques that I won't go into, complicated technology. The essence of their technique is if you're sick and you recover, let's say with a pneumonia, what antibodies have you raised that fends off that pneumonia? And their technique is they can find the individual cell that generates that antibody. Coronavirus hits. Before it's a pandemic, talk to, they talk to people, I think it was the NIH, and they get a sample of blood from one of the first COVID patients, from one of the first patients that recovered from COVID. And you ask the question, how come this patient survives and others unfortunately went, died? What is unique about this patient's blood? In the blood sample, <coughs> excuse me, there are 6 million immune cells capable of making antibodies. Which is the one cell that's gonna make the antibody against COVID? And that's the question they do. They have the blood sample, they put it through their series of tests. Within four days, there are 6 million cells are reduced down to 4 million. After 23 days, they have 24 potential cell lines. They figured out the genome of these cells that can make an antibody, a monoclonal antibody to the coronavirus. They send these 24 cells to the vaccine uh, research center at the NIH and they say, okay, boys, 
which is the cell line that I want to develop? They get an answer back. And they develop a cell line which turns on if a map. But I forgot to tell you, these guys at UCB, after they developed this technology, they formed a company called Abcelera. <laughs> so now all of this is moved out of UCB and it's being done in a company labs. So they know what the monoclonal antibody is. The pandemic comes out on March 12th. That's when the WHO declares the pandemic. The next day on March 12th, March 12th, they line up with Lilly Company in the United States, a big pharmaceutical company, to say, hey, we got the goods, but we can't, we can't produce it. And we really don't have the resources to run a trial. So Lilly, they uh, write a trial prospectus, they get it going, and 90 days after they send from the patient who was sick, the first injection goes into a trial patient of a monoclonal antibody to COVID. These monoclonals are good. I'm not going to go into how good they are. We'll leave that for the question period. Maybe Don will talk about it or I can talk about it later. Suffice it to say that by November of this year, both Health Canada and the FDA approved for emergency use this monoclonal. More than it's used in Israel, it's used in at least 12 other countries where it's been, been approved and more than 100,000 doses have been administered. It saves lives. We know variants are coming. They're going to be a problem. So the company has taken their uh, bamlinivimab, and they've partnered with a company in China that also makes monoclonals, this etacivimab. And if one is good, hey, let's combine two in a drug and maybe we'll have a better chance if if, uh, <coughs> if mutants come along. But they haven't stopped there. There's another company in the United States in San Francisco, who's also which is also capable of making a monoclonal called VIR 7831. And they've partnered with that company. And in anticipation of what might come down the future, this company is already working on two other drugs to combat mutants if the the bam lab uh, lab is unsuccessful by itself. Okay, so I've only honed in on three research projects occurring in Canada. There are many of them, but I thought this would be like a clinical evening where we could ask uh, questions to Don Shepard. What I've honed in is, <coughs> is that in Canada, we're capable of making a COVID test. That's done by researchers the, at, at, here at McGill, part of the MI4 group. <clears throat> the Canadian COVID vaccine is called COVID virus-like particles. The lead investigator on that, and the fellow who's written all the papers, the protocols for the studies is Dr. Brian Ward. Dr. Brian Ward is a member of the MI4 team. He has his research labs at McGill. So McGill has contributed to developing a COVID test and McGill will contribute to the only Canadian homegrown vaccine. And then we've got a Canadian homegrown mon uh, monoclonal that's already been on the market since November and has saved thousands of lives. We're capable of doing this. Canada can do it. Let's talk a little bit about what Trudeau said the other day and where we stand with our vaccines. Canadian government gave out contracts, I think it was in August, September, October, to different companies, and we purchased vaccines. We have, we've purchased or we've placed orders for 350 million doses of vaccines, and the Canadian government has already spent a billion dollars. If the companies are unsuccessful in producing the vaccine, our money is lost. But we didn't know which company would be successful when these contracts were, were awarded. And we didn't know which platform would work best and which vaccine is going to work the longest. So the Canadian government purchased vaccines that were based on messenger or mRNA technology. That's a completely new technology that's never been used, really, not for what we're doing now. 
They've purchased vaccines based on a DNA uh, technology that uses adenoviruses. And that technology is well, well established, been used for many, many other conditions. And they produce and they purchased vaccines based on protein technology where the individuals just immunized with the protein of the coronavirus. So let's see where we are now. Pfizer's not delivering vaccines. Moderna's not delivering vaccines. Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and Novavax have submissions to the Canadian government. We don't know when they will be approved, if they will be approved. And so in Canada, we're really dependent on multinationals to give us the vaccines. Medicago can produce it, but Medicago has a problem. Their officers went to the Canadian government at least 24 times and said, hey, we got the goods, we can make vaccines, but they never got a grant. After COVID in October, the Trudeau government gave them a grant of $173 million to build a facility so now we can produce 2 billion vaccines a year should we have another pandemic. However, the United States government was a little ahead of the ball. They gave Medicago a grant, I think it was in 2015, and they said, hey, we need a, a mono, uh, monovalent flu vaccine, and here's enough money, go build a plant in uh, Durham, North Carolina, and give us 10 million doses of vaccine per month using your plant technology. And they delivered 10 million doses of vaccine. So Medicago has a plant in Durham, North, Car Car North Carolina. If their trial on 30,000 patients is now successful, the virus is uh, good in the real world, we will get Medicago vaccine that's gonna produce in Durham, North Carolina. We do not have the facilities to do it here in Canada. So, uh, so what happened on Tuesday? Uh, uh, our Prime Minister Trudeau made an announcement that the National Research Council here in Montreal and Royal Mount Avenue is going to get $126 million to build a vaccine facility. We don't have this kind of stuff in Canada. And also, the Novavax, uh, Novavax vaccine is being under review of Canada, in Canada, and the Novavax company will get facilities to produce their vaccine in the National Research Council of building, it building. It's being built. Medicago is building a facility at $173 million so that we can produce vaccines. And we talked about three things that were happening. There's a lot of other things happening in Canada, but I just, felt I didn't have time to talk about everything. <laughs> There's a company called Precision Nanosystems in Vancouver, and they got a $25 million grant, and they're going to build a facility. And unlike Medicago, that's producing a plant-based vaccine, they're going to be producing an mRNA vaccine. I didn't talk about them because they're only going into phase one trials. Their trials are not as advanced as Medicago. We don't know how successful they'll be. And then at the University of Saskatoon, uh, there's a, uh, the professors there formed a company called Vito Intervac. They got a $46 million grant on Tuesday. And they only just now got approval for them to take their vaccine and start phase one studies. So we don't know, uh, it's unlikely that Precision Nanosystems or the University of Saskatoon We'll have a vaccine in 2021. The good thing about all of this now is we have four facilities, one in Montreal, one in Quebec City, where uh, Medicago is, one in Vancouver, where Precision Nanosystem is, and one at the university, each one capable of producing vaccines for a pandemic. When they get online, all told, Canada, Canada should be able to produce about 3 billion vaccines per year. We were just behind the, the times. We got flat-footed and just didn't have the capacity. Okay, so what, I, what I'd like to do now is ask the participants 
ask any questions about what's going on in, in uh, research uh, or what I've presented. But uh, more importantly, I'd like to introduce Don Shepard and tell him what he's supposed to do now. <laughs> uh, Don is known to probably most of you that are on this Zoom conference. He's a, he's a thorn in the side of Premier Legault. He's uh, gotten Premier Legault to back down on at least two, if not three of his decisions uh, to make his decisions based on science, not on politics. Uh, he's a medical visionary. He, his, his research actually is in the area of fungus and aspergillus. And he's had to really pull back on that. He's uh, really come front and center for McGill and for all Quebecers because of this COVID. And we thank him for everything that he's doing for our province. The other thing, Don, is he's uh, part of the Canadian COVID Task Force. We've all heard him express opinions on one dose of vaccine, two dose. Maybe he'll express his opinion on tra uh, travelers now. But I'm going to start the question period rolling by saying, hey, Don is a member of the Canadian COVID Task Force. What do you do? And do you influence our, our prime ministers? Do you influence our uh, premiers? And I'll turn it over to you as the first question. And after that is up to our 200 participants. You want any questions answered on COVID, write it on the chat, uh, chat and Don or I might address those questions. So Don, I'll let you take it. Let, me, let me just jump in one second, Dr. Tannenbaum. First of all, thank you very much. If you would please stop the screen sharing. Okay. On your side. Uh, I gotta know how to do that because my my pointer's not working. And okay, I got out. Now my pointer's working. Okay. There you go. You got it. Honey. You're on, Don. So tell us what you do on the COVID task force. So there are many COVID task forces. The one that I'm on is the COVID therapeutics task force for the federal government. And we're tasked with two major jobs. The first is advising the government on securing adequate supplies of the different therapeutic options that are out there, whether they're sourced locally or internationally. How much are we going to need? When should we buy it? Which ones are worth buying? Which ones do we see shortages coming for? So for example, the Bamlanivimab, we were one of the ones to recommend the government buy a stockpile of that, which we now have. Uh, the other big job is to review all of the applications uh, for clinical trials that are asking for federal government support because everybody in the beginning of COVID thought, hey, my favorite drug that I use for disease X is going to be the miracle cure for COVID. And some of them, as you have recently seen, come out with these incredible press releases. And when you open up the hood and see what's underneath, you realize it's a go-kart and not a Ferrari, and that the Canadians are really looking for the Ferraris here, not the go-karts. So that's, it's essentially being a critical body that's at arm's length that says yay or nay to different molecules, buy them, sell them, invest in them, develop them or not. So um, I've been monitoring the chat as you've been going, Jaime, and, and um, one of the big questions that's, the big two questions that have come up are around the vaccines. One about this whole delaying the first dose issue, and the second about vaccines and variants. These are the hot topics. I literally have this question asked of me twice a day, every single day. I have already presented the answer to these two questions twice today to other groups. So you are, your fingers are on the pulse of what everybody's asking. All right, the delaying the dose issue, because this is scary for a lot of people. You hear all these numbers thrown around in the press. And the two big numbers that everyone keeps throwing around are, oh, the first dose protects 50%. No, 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 the first dose protects 90%. And it seems like somehow the scientists should be able to get their ducks in a row and sort out the difference between 50% and 90%, right? This is not a rounding error. This is not the kind of difference you like to hear us muddling up. I'll tell you, it's actually incredibly simple and it's not 50%. That is categorically, simply, I'm not being subtle here, the wrong number. All right, here's the skinny. When you get the vaccine, right? You go into the clinic, they jab the needle into your arm. Does it work? 
30 seconds after you've had the vaccine. Anyone think it does? Of course not. Vaccines train your immune system. And just like when you decide it's finally time to shed your COVID-19 and you get a personal trainer and you start to work out, you don't hop on the scale the next morning and expect all 19 pounds of those to have disappeared. They don't. It takes time to train your body, it takes time to train your immune system. And we know exactly how long it takes to train your immune system with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines from their trial. Because in the first 12 to 14 days after the people got their dose, there was absolutely zero effect. No protection, buckus, nothing. You following me so far? So day 14 is when the immune system is ramped up enough so that there is some expectation of protection. All right, what happens then between day 14 and day 21? Well, people get protected. And then on day 21 in the Pfizer trial, everybody got their second shot. So if we wanna know what happened after the first shot, we got a very small window. It's that 21 day window and it's divided into two chunks. The first chunk where nothing is expected to happen and the second chunk where the vaccine is working. You may see where I'm going with this. The 50% number comes from taking all 21 days. So that means if somebody walks out of the vaccine clinic and goes straight to the hospital ICU with COVID, that's counted as a vaccine failure in that 50% number, which is rubbish. That's not an endpoint that we use in clinical trials. We only start looking for the effects when the molecule is supposed to be working. So if you look at the 14 to 21 day window, guess what? It's 90 plus percent effective. In fact, it's statistically speaking, absolutely the same as the overall end of the trial after two doses. And what's really powerful is Moderna's trial showed exactly the same numbers. And I mean exactly the same numbers. And the third vaccine, the Oxford vaccine also between the two doses showed the same efficacy as after the second dose, if you give it time to work. You following me here? So the answer is very simple. At least for the first seven days after the vaccine kicks in, I can guarantee you that it is working as well as it would work after that. But how long? And that's the question. That's the one we don't have the answer to because we only know what happens if you get your booster on day 21 or day 28. That's the only thing the trial did. There wasn't any other option, so everybody got that. So we're flying a bit blind here. But it's not as blind as you might think because we've given a lot of vaccines over the years to a lot of people. And we know that booster timing is nowhere near as critical as getting the first dose in. In fact, many boosters, the recommendations are if you miss your booster and you show up a year late, we just give it to you then. We don't give you a bonus shot because it's gonna work just as well. So a lot of us are not as stressed about the timing of this. We wouldn't wanna to go to six months because that's starting to stretch it a little bit. But in the sort of three month zone we're talking about, we're well within the range that we would expect a vaccine response from this first dose to last. However, a couple of caveats, we obviously don't know. And we don't know if the response that we're getting is good enough to treat wild type virus that we all meet nowadays, but is it gonna be good enough for the variants? Before we get to the variants though, I wanna throw one little piece of evidence on the puzzle here or on top of the pile to make you feel a little bit better about the delayed first dose. And that comes from the Oxford vaccine trial. So when they rolled out that trial, there was all sorts of crazy things that happened. I'm sure some of you heard that they, they misloaded the, the, the vials for the first dose and half the people in the trial only got a half dose, which is a little, you know, not cool. You're supposed to give everybody the same amount, right? But we'll leave that aside. The other thing that happened is they actually didn't have enough vaccine made to do the trial when they started the trial. So they timed their second dose as whenever we can get it to you. And so as you can imagine, we have some data on people who got it early and people who got it late. So who do you think had a better immune response? The people who got the booster early, less than six weeks, or the people who got the booster later than six weeks? Well, it's actually the people who got it later than six weeks. And in fact, later boosting than 21 and 28 days is the norm. And it's what we usually do. We only did it so short in the Moderna and Pfizer trials because we wanted the trials to be short so we could get these vaccines into people's arms. So there's a lot of reason to think that this is not a crazy approach and that, that the Quebec government is actually following the science. It's a little scary because it's a calculated risk and everyone's watching like a hawk because if there's any evidence that this isn't lasting like we think, or a variant start to appear that are breaking through, we're gonna to have to pivot on a dime. 
So that's the segue to variance. Variance, variance, variance. That's the hot topic, right? So what's a variant? Everything on earth mutates, including us. That's the great cycle of life. If you don't mutate, you don't evolve, you don't evolve, you die out. And viruses are no exceptions. But viruses mutate at very different rates. Again, to go back to my car analogy, you have things like the HIV virus that mutate at the rate of a Lamborghini. And then you have other viruses, say the polio virus, that mutates at about the rate of a Bixie. So where does COVID-19 fit between the Bixie and the Lamborghini? Well, fortunately for us thus far, it's much closer to that cute little bicycle that's sitting on the street corner and much further away from the rip roaring thing that's uh, tearing up your roads. But it's not not moving. It is mutating and it is acquiring mutations. And we saw it early on. The Asian version of COVID-19 was much less effective at infecting people than the one that hit North America and Europe because it had one single mutation in the famous spike protein, which is the hook that the uh, virus uses to grab hold of your cells. And that particular mutation stabilized the protein so that every virus of this Gen 2 virus had four to six fold more hooks than the original one. And people think that's in part why Asia was spared compared to the rest of the world in wave one, because we had the bad virus and they were dealing with the easier virus. So that was the first set of mutations. And now we've identified the second generation of mutations. It started with the famous UK variant. And again, the UK variant tweaked its spike protein to be better at hanging on to your cells so that it was 50% more infectious because you needed less particles. If the particles are better at getting inside you, you don't need as many attacks for them to get into your immune system. So that was the UK variant. The good news about the UK variant was whenever we took antibodies, either the uh, synthetic ones that Jaime told you about, or ones from people who've been vaccinated, or even ones from people who've been infected, and we added them to the virus, they worked perfectly. There was no problem with them. So the UK variant was a transmission problem, but not a vaccine problem. Enter stage left, the South African variant. The South African variant changed the game. It has two mutations again in this spike protein, but this time those mutations help it dodge some of the antibodies that you make in response to infection or vaccination. At least in a test tube, when we looked at antibodies made by the Moderna vaccine, they were six-fold less active. Now, that wasn't the end of the world because you probably have a hundred times more antibodies that you need. So cutting it down by a factor of six, you're still in the safe zone. But that's assuming you're a healthy young person whose immune system has done exactly what it's supposed to, like in the trials, and you got your two doses on schedule, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when we start mucking around with pushing our doses, maybe you're over the age of 80, maybe you're immunocompromised, maybe you're just having a bad day and you don't quite mount the immune response of someone else, you might be bumping up against the vaccine not working as well. And there's reason to think that this might actually be true, sadly, and that's come in the last week. And that is the results of the trials in South Africa of two new vaccines, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the uh, Novavax vaccine. These are two vaccines that were tested in either the UK or the North America and South Africa against the South African variant. And while they worked very nicely in the sort of non-South African variant territory in the UK or the US, 80, 90% depending on the vaccine, they were only 60% effective against the South African variant in South Africa. Now, they still were very effective at preventing severe disease, even when they didn't prevent it. So they're still working and they're still doing something, but it's a scary signal that maybe the South African variant and the Brazilian variant, which is very similar, could actually manage to break through some of the vaccine defenses. Now, it's a single observation still. There are lots of differences between South Africa, Britain, and North America, and it could be that the difference in the way the vaccine worked had nothing to do with the variant, but common things are common. It's happened twice. We have a test tube evidence that matches up with it. Most of us are scared. And that's why those of you that are down there in Florida and are thinking of coming home are facing a little incarceration period because we've had exactly 13 cases of the South African variant last time I checked, and we wanna keep it that way. 
So that's where the sudden interest in keeping people a little more locked up and a little less travel is coming from because people are starting to see that the vaccines might not be as perfect as we would like them to be. All right, uh, where are we? We did the variants. Herd immunity. Okay, that's a great question. So I'm gonna say something that is a little bit heretical. I don't care about herd immunity. I really don't. And I think we've sold you a pig and a poke, which is a terrible thing to say at a Jewish event, but you get the idea. The concept here is very simple. What are we doing? We're rolling out the vaccine all across Canada in vulnerable populations, elderly, nursing care, say HSLD, long-term care, right? That's the goal. Why are we picking those people first? Because they are the risk at risk of complications. So as we succeed in this, and as we get to community dwelling adults, and as we start to roll down from 80 year olds to 70 year olds to 60 year olds, what are we gonna see? Anybody doubt that we're gonna see a sudden reduction in the number of deaths and hospitalizations? Assuming it works, assuming the vaccine works, that's what's gonna happen. At that point, every single person who's been fighting against masks, who's been fighting against closures, who says this is not a real viral infection, it's caseitis, is going to jump up and say, you're destroying my livelihood and shutting down society and look, nobody's dying and nobody's in the hospital. We don't shut down our society for the common cold. We don't shut it down for influenza. We don't shut it down for a hundred other communicable diseases. It's time to end this and society is likely to open up because it's going to be hard to defend against that logic. That's the true exit strategy. That's the true return to what we will call normal is, to use another metaphor, the iron wall around our susceptibles. It's not a dome. It's Canada, we can have our own wall, but we're gonna use it in a good way, right? And that to me is actually the real question you need to ask. When are we gonna to get to that point? Because then we're gonna see a change in the rules. Once we have confidence that susceptible people are vaccinated, and even if we can test and check your antibodies and know and tell you for sure, go hug your grandkids, you're good. That's gonna happen long before we start vaccinating under 11 year olds who've never been tested in the clinical trials. Uh, once you get two vaccines, you're exposed, how long are you a carrier? So this whole business of can you transmit if you've had the vaccine is kind of something that's crept into the media. And I gotta tell you, it actually doesn't fit with any science that anybody has ever heard of. There is not a single vaccine on planet earth directed against a pathogen that doesn't prevent transmission. There's exactly one vaccine that doesn't prevent transmission and it's directed against a toxin that the bacteria makes. So the antibodies leave the bacteria alone, they just neutralize the toxin. But every other vaccine that has ever been invented reduces transmission. Why? Well, you make antibodies that kill the virus. So obviously, if your antibodies go up, your virus goes down, and this isn't rocket science, you're less transmissive, and you transmit less. We're seeing that in the data from Israel. We're seeing that in the data from the Oxford vaccine. We're seeing it in all of the studies. So it is going to be true. But that doesn't mean it's going to be 100% effective, just like it's not gonna be 100% effective to prevent disease because nothing in this universe is 100% effective. That's life, right? There's no guarantees. We didn't get a contract when we entered this world. We don't get one when we leave. So there will certainly be people that have had vaccinated that will get COVID and therefore can transmit COVID. And probably most of them will be asymptomatic because most people that get COVID are asymptomatic which is why until we have a better handle on those numbers and until we have a better handle on how many variants are out there that might be escaping the vaccine, it's not a great idea to treat the fact that you've been vaccinated as a passport for saying, I am never gonna be a danger to anyone else. It's why in the hospital, even though I've been vaccinated and all the other doctors who are on the wards now at the MUHC have been vaccinated, we're still wearing PPE and we're not wearing the PPE to protect ourselves, we're wearing the PPE to protect our patients because we don't wanna be spreading the virus to our patients as has happened in the past. 
uh, Brazilian, actually just one state. Yes, it's in Amazonas, but it's not just in Brazil, actually, at the moment. It's already been found in the U.S. and many other places. These are actually horrible names to call them, uh, but the uh, license plate terms for each of these drugs, or these uh, variants, are quite unpalatable and um, remarkably similar. So if you're someone that doesn't like numbers like I do, calling them by B.1.6.35 is a lot more complicated than just saying the South African variant. And, and, you know, the name isn't important. As I said, South African variant, 13 cases here in Canada, including a number with no travel history. And the hot off the presses is the UK has found a UK variant of the UK variant that has the same mutations as the South African variant. So these things are evolving everywhere, but very few people here in Canada. And so if we allow our population to evolve and we don't bring in new virus from the huge pot that is the rest of the world, our appearance of variants will be slower than if we import them at the same time as they are developing here on Canadian soil. Uh, okay, where are we? Why can't Artopex make vaccines? I have no idea. I don't know what Artopex is. Sorry about that one. When do I predict? I think I covered that one. Uh, in Asia, wasn't it because these countries dealt with more head-on aggressively? So there certainly were some countries that were very aggressive that did testing strategies. However, that isn't uniform. Uh, and the, the actual modeling of the transmission rates, the R naughts, et cetera, et cetera, of the initial wave one spread, not talking about wave two now, but wave one spread, they were drastically different in wave ones in Asia than they were here. After that, absolutely everything else came into play, but the spread was significantly lower in Asia than, it, we, yeah, than uh, we saw in the rest of the world after that mutation. Now in Asia, of course, they've got the Western virus that has come back into Asia and everyone's on a level, unfortunate playing ground. The monoclonal antibodies, I presume, are antiviral must be given early. Absolutely. So the uh, monoclonal antibodies, the science is so elegant and beautiful and cool. It really is. These antibodies bind to the spike protein. They selected exquisitely effective ones. They essentially mimic someone that's been vaccinated. But as was alluded to in the question, there are two stages to COVID disease. The first stage is the viral part. That's when the virus is growing and replicating in you. You have a fever, you feel crappy, you're a little short of breath. But then there's the inflammatory phase where your body is reacting inappropriately to the infection and going crazy. And essentially your immune system has turned into a raging firestorm that is chewing up your body, making clots and destroying your lung. At that point, the virus is gone or not part of the equation. So the monoclonal antibodies are not helpful in the slightest. And in fact, the window to use them is very small. It's probably the first 48 hours after you have the onset of symptoms and the uh, effect of those antibodies drops off very quickly after that fact, after that time point. Given the Novavax, da, 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 da. so uh, the Novavax vaccine versus the mRNA vaccines. This is really kind of interesting. The Novavax vaccine is, as was pointed out, is a protein vaccine. And you'll never guess what protein? Yes, indeed, it's the spike protein, just as the mRNAs in both the Moderna and the Pfizer, which frankly are Coke and Pepsi, are mRNAs against that produce the spike protein. So in reality, when you get the mRNA vaccines, what happens is the mRNA is taken up by the cells in your arm, and you know what they do? They use that mRNA to make spike protein. So from your immune system point of view, guess what it sees? spike protein. And so it's actually a very simple and obvious hypothesis that injecting spike protein and injecting mRNA that makes, makes spike protein might give you a similar immune response. And indeed, when you drill down to the Novavax data in the UK, the efficacy of the protein against the strains that were not UK variant, not South African variant, that were the old fashioned strains that were the ones that Moderna had to fight in its trial, the efficacy was absolutely identical. I believe it's 96 versus 95.8. If I'm not, I'm making those numbers up, but it's pretty darn close to that. In other words, these things are all doing the same thing to your immune system. And it's impressive how reproducible science is because it's not made up stuff, it's real. All right, uh, where are we? Things are moving quickly here. Discuss long haulers. Well, I, I can't. 
Because the answer is we simply don't know anything about long haulers. There is a, uh, a lot of people that uh, feel that they have a lot of symptoms long after COVID. And they seem to be a wide range of things from people who've been in the ICU, almost died and are expected to have horrific symptoms and to be crawling out of this pit that their body has fallen into that often takes up to a year. And then there are totally healthy, well people that feel they now have chronic fatigue afterwards. But the problem is there's no blood test. There's no anything that we can do to say, oh, this is what it is that's wrong. So there's a lot of energy going now into studying those people and seeing, hey, is there actually something that we can put our finger on to say, this should be high and it's low. This should be low and it's high. Or here's something we can put our finger on to fix. But the answer is there's still a lot of unknowns there. All right, uh, what is the rationale of making international, uh, I'm sorry, the answer is you have to ask a politician that question because I don't make those rules. I can tell you that isolating people who are entering the country makes sense because you need to make sure they're not bringing a variant with them. How you do that, that's a political question. Why not target more people? People are more likely to be super spreaders, aren't we being soft? Better to shut down and have more preventive actions. So Marilyn, I'll tell you the answer to this one and I've said it many, many times and it's what got me yelled at by Premier Legault last week um, in a, in a, uh, and taken to task and being called irresponsible. I think we have dropped the ball by not rolling out rapid diagnostic tests in the workplace, say SSLDs, hospital settings, in all of those places where we're at risk for super spreader events. I don't care if they're 50% sensitive. Right now, we find exactly 0% of asymptomatic infected people who are spreading the virus. And every study that's ever looked at it suggests that's a minimum of 70% of people infected and as much as 90% of people who are infected. They don't know they're infected. They're infectious, they spread the virus. We are finding none of them. And it's not rocket science to figure out we're never going to stop the spread if we let 70 to 90 percent of the contagious people wander around their daily lives and infect other people. We need to use the rapid diagnostics. They're tools that will find those people and let them know they're infectious. All right, IVIG, total failure. No, don't do it. Plasma transfer. No, don't do it. Why would you not use the monoclonal antibodies, which are these designer, completely controlled, perfectly quantified, exactly made, pharmaceutical grade, I know exactly what's going in your arm, directed against the virus, versus a total hodgepodge of antibodies that could do everything known to man. And that's why the trials of the plasma transfer have failed. If you're talking about IVIG during inflammation, during the later phase, again, the problem is it's too heterogeneous a molecule and it really hasn't been holding up. We're much better off with the dexamethasone and the anti-IL-6 drugs, which do the job in a way that we can target, measure, and control. All right, what therapeutics actually work? Well, I just gave you two of them. So uh, the anti-IL-6, IL-6 is a, essentially an immune hormone that turns up your inflammation. The anti-IL-6 are antibodies that go in and neutralize IL-6. So it's like grabbing the thermostat and turning it down. They work. Dexamethasone works. You know, does remdesivir work? Eh, you know, maybe a little bit. Better than nothing, but not a lot. Does colchicine work? Eh, maybe. I doubt it. And I certainly wouldn't give 28 days of a pretty toxic drug to anyone based on eh, maybe. None of those are very convincing drugs. Dexamethasone, anti-IL-6, those are convincing drugs. Anticoagulation, because of the clots that form in people's lungs during the inflammatory phase, very important. That works. So that's really it for the, the big three that we know make a difference. I haven't, I haven't. Okay, are all autoimmune reactions the same? Uh, so, are you talking, um, sorry, I don't know what you're asking her. Are you asking about the inflammatory phase or are you asking about autoimmune reactions? Because they're, they're not actually autoimmune reactions. They're, uh, they're inflammatory reactions, but they're not autoimmune. There's no autoantibodies that are forming here. Um, but they do seem to all share almost the entire, the trunk of the, uh, what we call the pathogenesis, how this thing turns on is remarkably similar. Uh, the why people get there is what's different. Um, and what happens at the end, that's what's different. But the basic 
uh, part of the immune system that's deranged is actually very, very similar. And that's the trunk where dexamethasone, IL-6 inhibitors and the like act. But once you get past that, all the bad things that happen, whether it's HLH, as has been mentioned here, whether it's clots or the like, that is much more dependent on the individual's genetics and variability. Just like who gets sick in the first place is dependent on people's genetics and variability. How are we doing for time, by the way? I don't actually know when we're supposed to wrap up. Peter, what's the, what's the time here? You're on mute. I think we're good. Uh, as long as you're okay, I think we have another 10, 15 minutes, if that's okay, okay. with you. Yep. So I'm looking to see what else we got here. Da, da, da. Given the Nova action, we better... So the combination with monoclonal antibodies, the, the honest truth is that, um, that um, for all of the host-directed therapies except dexamethasone, all of the data that I have seen and some that I can talk about and most that I can't talk about, because as you can imagine, my work on the task force has all sorts of non-disclosures, have been very, very disappointing. The only thing that I have seen data sets that are compelling are for the specific monoclonals that I mentioned, the antibodies that target IL-6 and the antibodies that are targeting the, um, the virus itself, either in prophylaxis to prevent infection or early in infection. Um, there's a, a couple of more dossiers that are actually coming next week that I'm optimistic might have something. And there's a couple of antivirals that are in trials right now that I think we may be able to combine with remdesivir to be, remdesivir to be effective. But at, at the moment, there's nothing that has hit the level of evidence that I would be comfortable saying I would give it to Jaime if he's in the ICU. Not that I want you in the ICU. All right, if I have a serious allergic reaction to flu shot, is it safe to get a COVID vaccine? So that's an interesting question. The official recommendations are, you are not supposed to get an mRNA vaccine if you've had an allergic reaction to another vaccine, but, 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 that is anaphylaxis. If you had diarrhea, if you felt unwell, if you had a headache, if you had a fever, if you had anything other than anaphylaxis, that is not a contraindication. If you've had anaphylaxis to a bee sting, peanut butter, or matzo balls, that is not a contraindication. All that to be said, the truth is that makes no sense. There is no shared ingredient in the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine and the flu vaccine. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines contain exactly two things, mRNA and PEG, which is essentially kind of a, a fatty detergent-y thing that we use to stabilize the RNA, neither of which is in your standard flu vaccine. So I'm not telling you to go get the mRNA vaccine. I can just tell you, whether it may, that in fact, it makes absolutely no sense. All right. Ben would like to know if he can go to Sri Lanka next year for Christmas. I think it's worth a shot. I'd get cancelable tickets, but I'd make it, I'd, I'd book for that. I'm looking at booking stuff in late fall of uh, this year and crossing my fingers, but I don't guarantee it. When are 60 year olds gonna get the vaccine? So nobody can answer when anybody is gonna get the vaccine because quite frankly, as you can all recognize right now, the supply at the federal level is out of our control. If the vaccine was to arrive when it was supposed to arrive, 60 year olds will be getting the vaccine sometime in April, May. But we have absolutely no idea where that schedule is today. If your test is negative, you can become infected the next day. Right, so can I just emphasize this again? Because somehow people just seem to not grasp this concept. A negative COVID test after an exposure does not mean you won't get COVID, period. Done deal. It means you don't have COVID the minute you got the test. There is an incubation period. It is variable anywhere up to 11 days and a median of five days. If you get a test, all it tells you is that day you don't have COVID. Two days later, you may have COVID. In fact, the only thing that we've done with testing that helps on that, and in fact, we've incorporated it into recommendations and CDC adopted it, came out of one of our studies. If you have a single obvious fixed exposure, you stay completely isolated after that exposure, and seven days later, you get a nasopharyngeal PCR test. So the gold standard brain biopsy swab that goes back behind your ear kind of test, and it's negative, then 
you are officially too late to develop it and you're good. But that's the only way a test can take you off isolation. Everything else is Russian roulette. Uh, should we be wearing masks? Should we be wearing two masks? No, you should not be wearing two masks. Two masks have never been studied. There's absolutely no data that two masks work. That's kind of like saying I'm gonna wear two sets of gloves. I don't know, could it work? Sure, but there is absolutely no evidence that two masks work. Chances are what will happen, they will make your masks so tight to air moving through that no air will go through the mask anymore and all the air is gonna go around your masks. At which point you've defeated half of the purpose of the filtration of the mask. Which is why I say, don't do it because it seems like a good idea because there are many reasons why it probably isn't a good idea. It's why we don't tell people to wear N95s that haven't been properly fitted. If you have an N95 that has not been properly fitted, what will happen is you will have a crack. And because the N95s are so thick and air has to work so hard to get through them, if it doesn't have a good seal and you breathe through it, almost all the air will go in and out of that hole pretty much removing the value to having a 95% filter on the part of the air that isn't moving through the mask. Exactly what I just said for K95, same thing. They need to be fitted properly or you lose most of the benefit. How long is immunity after COVID-19? So that's a great question. The antibodies decline between three and six months, particularly after mild cases, they decline earlier. But here's the funny part we've seen remarkably few second infections. So statistically, we should have seen 10 times more second infections if the antibody levels we're measuring were really predicting protection. So a lot of us think that it's another arm of your immune system called your T cells that are actually giving the defense after infection. And we don't have good tests that are easy to use to measure those. So, most people in the first three months are pretty rock solid defended. After that, all bets are off. And that's why we should say to people that you should get vaccinated, ideally three months after you have infection. And that second dose of the vaccine, guess what? It's pretty much your booster shot after the first dose that you got from natural infection. Do I think we'll need yearly COVID vaccines? Who knows, it's a great question. Um, I don't think it'll be yearly, but I think that it's likely that this virus will drift and mutate and eventually we will need to have boosters that have slightly different sequences. Already Moderna is designing a booster for the South African and Brazilian variant to be used in the event that this does continue to become a problem and we start to see breakthrough cases. So that is uh, much more likely, I think, than many of us thought it was going to be initially. All right, where else we got? Why aren't Down syndrome? But yeah, you'll have to ask the government for that one. It is directly in violation of the, of the uh, scientific framework of why they're vaccinating. My honest opinion is nobody thought of it. Nobody knew the data and it slipped through the cracks. My prediction is that in the very short term, you're gonna see that Down syndrome will appear on the list and the sort of high risk category. And whether they group those people with the community dwelling 80 year olds, 70 year olds, I don't know, but I predict someone will wake up to the fact that they just missed that vulnerable group and that they need to fix it. So I've been telling everybody, in fact, I said this on Temple, uh, the Temple talk on Tuesday, keep agitating for this, but don't do it in the Gazette. Politicians don't read the Gazette. They only read Le Devoir and La Presse. I've said some horrible things in the Gazette that they never were bothered by. First time I said something bad in the Le Devoir, they were all over me. Yeah. I can... Yeah, thank you. I think, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Shepard, I, I see two more questions that I... Oh, I see you. Oh, here's a good one. Is it good to wear vinyl gloves in a store? No, no, absolutely not. Please do not wear gloves of any stripe, shape, or color. No gloves. Gloves, bad. Okay? What you should do is what everybody else is doing is wash your hands. The virus cannot penetrate your skin. It absolutely cannot. It can only go into your mucous membranes, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. And so how does it get there? You breathe it in or you stick your hand in some really nasty thing and then you stick your hand in your face. You are far more likely, and there are studies that prove this, you are far more likely to contaminate your hands with gloves and touch yourself in the face because your brain thinks your hands are sterile when they're wearing gloves. They're no more sterile than ungloved hands are. Wash your hands. Use the skin that God gave you. It works. 
Uh, from Stephanie, are people who've had chemotherapy more vulnerable to the virus? It actually surprisingly seems that that is, is um, not anywhere near as bad as we thought. And the only people who are more vulnerable are people on active chemotherapy. People with a history of chemotherapy have just not appeared as a signal, as a group that have more severe COVID. So um, if you're actively immunosuppressed right now with chemotherapy, then you are at more risk for severe outcomes, of course, just like all infectious diseases. If your chemotherapy is over and done with and your cancer is gone, the good news is one thing you don't seem to have to worry about more than anybody else is COVID. Any other questions? I don't, I don't see any. Oh, one more. Let's be, let's be the last one. Both Which is work just fine, Ruth. It's not what you wash with, it's doing it properly. None of this theater of hand washing in the stores that we all see so often. Wash your hands, pretend you're a surgeon, do the whole thing, get in the cracks, do a good job, and then you're golden. I don't know what, it, what is the non-COVID medical cost. Oh, actually I do know what that means. So th that is a superb question. I'm glad you put that up there. It's one of the reasons I've been railing against the government and, and been pushing so hard to have restrictions that many people felt were too draconian. The non-COVID cost to the healthcare system has been disastrous. The amount of surgeries that have been delayed, chemotherapies delayed, the amount of standard medical care that we give that has been suboptimal for now coming on a year is staggering. The, uh, the, the size of tumors that are presenting to clinic are bigger now than they were a year ago. That's an actual study that breast cancer tumors are 20% larger right now when people get to surgery and to their doctor than they were a year ago because the system has slowed down. People are staying out of the hospitals. This is the true cost, the true health cost of the, of the COVID pandemic. And we're not gonna finish counting that cost for years to come. Yep, 50% chemo stopped, stroke treatment, absolutely right. And let me tell you, in the hospitals, you, you would not, if you work in a hospital every day and then you work in a hospital during COVID, it's not the same place. There's just no one in half the hospital. Well, I, I think people could ask you questions all night. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Rabbi Whitman, our rabbi at the Adath Israel, who is going to conclude the evening. Rabbi? Is Rabbi Whitman in the house? Yes. Yes, here I am. Okay. First of all, thank you very much, Dr. Peter Safran, for moderating this wonderful program. Thank you, Dr. Tannenbaum, Dr. Shepard. You have both been amazing and tremendously helpful to all of us. In March, the rabbis of Montreal, members of the Board of Rabbis, met to face what was happening. And there were two things that we understood very, very quickly. Number one, we have a responsibility as the rabbis of synagogues to help save lives and to keep people healthy. And number two, none of us had any idea of what to do. So one of the first things that we did in the middle of March, one of the smartest things that we did is that we turned to a group of experts to ask them for guidance, to answer our questions. Dr. Shepard is one of those who has generously given of his time to the rabbis of Montreal over this entire period. And I say this without exaggeration, there is no question in my mind that Dr. Shepard's advice to us has saved lives. I am deeply grateful to Dr. Shepard, Dr. Tannenbaum, to all of the doctors, researchers, nurses, technicians, all of the workers 
on the front lines who are risking their own health, who are putting themselves in harm's way, and who are doing their best to understand and to apply principles to, let's never forget the first word of this disease, novel, coronavirus. We're always learning more about it. I am so grateful that our community has science to rely on, to make decisions about. And I pray to God that he preserve and protect and keep healthy these wonderful professionals who are saving our lives. Thank you so much for this program. You have allayed so many anxieties and fears by your answers. And you have given us areas where we should be cautious and concerned. And we are deeply grateful to you. Thanks to everyone who has joined us tonight. We're very proud to have a very active programming schedule. We have a lot of other things coming up. Check out our website for all kinds of events. But this is something really special. This is something that involves, involves the highest priority of Judaism protecting life and health. And you doctors have helped us do it. We thank you very much.